podcast. We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Welcome back to episode 60 of The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors with Bob Cook and myself, Jackie Jones. And in this episode, we're going to be looking at working with self-esteem issues in the therapy room. Gosh, did I really hear what you said there in terms of, did you say, did you say this is session 60? This is episode 60. Our, I'm 71, so we're moving, we're moving nearer my decade. We'll be speeding past that very soon, Bob. <laughs> 60. Oh my gosh. Now this subject is fantastic because I would say without a doubt, nearly all clients that come in the clinical room are coming with issues around their sense of self. Yes, I agree. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So there isn't really um, a- a- anyone who doesn't come in the clinical room they, who hasn't got issues or challenges around the sense of self. Now, it may be not dressed up that way. They may come for other, other things, and we may deal with the other things. However, it, it, you know, self-agency, sense of self, robust sense of self, all these issues usually uh are there and even the people who come and i don't see many of them with narcissistic personality disorder or high up on the spectrum though some people might think the strange what i'm going to say here have huge problems around sense of self yeah now why is it strange because if you look into google if you look at the treatment books and the ways of work with narcissistic personality disorder they talk about things like, well the, well, the client will present with a great sense of entitlement. That doesn't actually mean that they have a robust sense of self, believe it or not. I mean, we've done, I think we've done a pod, pod, podcast on narcissism, so I won't go yeah. on that. But clients per se uh, will come in with self-esteem issues, whether they yeah. deal with them or not. Yeah. Increasingly so, I found, particularly... You know, if if because I work with parents and children a lot of the time, particularly, you know, the the younger teens I'm seeing now are coming in with self esteem issues and, you know, things that are impacting on them. I think from a much earlier age than what he used to do. Oh, well, I don't know about that. you. You you work with that population more. I I happen to think mainly is because psychotherapy and counselling is more popular, accessible. And 20, 30, 40, 50 years, we didn't see them. Yeah, we yeah, were well, quite possibly. Yeah. So that's one way of looking. Another way, where you're talking about, is that there's uh, perhaps more, you yeah, know, more issues, more stressful society, XXX, which, which um, then causes problems in terms of a sense of self for the, uh, the young child or et cetera, et cetera. But certainly, when we're talking about an injury to the self, um, then it can often be quite young. Yeah, yeah. And I, I don't think the pandemic's helped with a lot of this either. <laughs> oh, no. No, 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 no. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and of course, that <laughs> the pandemic was, you might want to say, a two-year trauma in yeah, itself yeah yeah in, inside that two-year traumas many 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 other traumas yeah yeah i i yeah i don't think well we none of us planned for it none of us have ever been through anything like this before so it was uncharted territories <laughs> and you know i think even for parents that were trying to maybe offer reassurance to the children we didn't have the answers. We didn't know what was around the corner. Mm-hmm. That's right. And um, that's why I'm going to phrase it. I'm sure this has been said before, but I'm going to say this terminology. We're in the middle of a mental health tsunami mm. that has been triggered by the pandemic. Yeah. And in that, 
you know, we have we have this genesis um, sense of self issues. Yes. It's 100%. I think this, the waves and the ripple effects of this are going to be seen for quite a few years to come. Or a generation. Yeah, yes, yeah. An absolute generation. We've had a pandemic and we've had a major war in Europe. Mm. And this war, this major war is still going on. Yeah. And we see uh, on our television sets every night like vicarious trauma and that trauma is um beamed into our living rooms and that in itself um causes uh, psychological or may cause psychological issues to our sense of self mm. we live in particularly uh psychologically disturbing times in my opinion yeah and you know, our our young people haven't haven't really been, you know, opened up to anything like this before. The the you know you were talking about robustness and resilience and things like that. You know, I know people talk about the snowflake generation and things like that, but you know, my children haven't ever had to experience anything like what is going on now I can remember when I I had this conversation with my son I can remember I was I think I was 13 or 14 when the last threat from the cold war and all those sort of things were around and I, I know that my mental health took a severe knock at that time you know we were sent home from school with leaflets on how to make a nuclear bomb shelter and take the doors off its hinges and do and it frightened the bejesus out of me you know, so it, it's like going back 40 odd years, the last time I think we'd experienced anything like the threats that we're, we're feeling against humanity. Mm, you're absolutely correct. And it is a mental health tsunami. Yeah. There's no doubt about that. Um, I, do, I still do a majority of the assessments at the Institute. And I also do all the assessments for the um, low cost placement. In the last three months, I've assessed 40 to 50 low cost placements. Yeah. And a majority of them have come um, with the process around mental health and the challenges to mental health. And a large proportion of those have been triggered off by the pandemic and the war that we're witnessing in Europe. Yeah. Which is understandable. Oh yeah, but how sad. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. Tragedy. This generation you're talking about. This, this, this generation um, has had more mental health challenges. Um, in 1962, which is probably, I I can go back to because I'm 71. I was 12 at the time. I think we had the Cuba crisis. Yeah. And this, maybe a lot of our listeners they'll have heard of the Cuban crisis I've that, heard of it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was the time where you know it was Khrushchev who stepped back um, really from uh, the possibility of a nuclear catastrophe um, and now we need Putin to step back mm. um, but we're in the we're in very psychologically um, difficult times. So, what can we do about self-esteem? With oh, our yeah. well, I, I, I work on? a sense of self, which is at risk to trauma and vicarious trauma. Self-esteem in itself it, it is about is about you know you mentioned it in a way. An antidote is resilience, building yeah. up resilience, bringing up you know building up a robust sense of self. Uh, we need to go and look at what drives the lack of self-esteem. You see, we can have behavioural plans, or I know you like plans. I do. <laughs> behavioural processes for self-esteem, in looking at the triggers, looking for more healthy coping mechanisms, looking at uh, all these uh, processes in the present, which are all very useful. And at the same time, unless we look at what drives uh, the lack of sense of self, 
I believe it's the behavioral processes have become more like a plaster. Yeah. So we need to look at the etiology or what drives the lack of sense of self. It's usually trauma one way or the other, whether we call that neglect for by the significant other people, whether we talk about that is where there's been some uh, abusive attack, whether we talk about that in terms of cumulative um, neglect, which I've just said, they're, they're all um, going to leave a person um, with low self-esteem. Yeah. See, when I think about self-esteem and working with clients, I always refer to Richard Erskine's Four Domains of the Self and the different areas and how, for me, being resilient or robust is, you know, the thinking and the behaviour, the physiological and the feeling all being quite the same level rather than I, I'm a thinker and a doer. That's what I do. When I'm stressed, I think a lot and I do a lot. And I often neglect the feeling and the physiological stuff. So I'm constantly working on processing my feelings and noticing changes in my body. That's that's something I'm kind of well aware of. But when I discuss that or talk to clients with that, it's kind of a bit of an eye opener knowing what we do in stressful situations. How do we cope when we're stressed? And then looking at maybe the parts that we don't really pay much attention to. Would you agree with that or not? Yes, that's certainly a good diagnostic model to look at the different senses of the self or like you've just said there. So, for example, somebody who comes in uh, highly cognitive uh, but they actually want to express their feelings yeah then you may have that as a goal but you'll probably have to work through the major channel of cognition to get to that part yeah 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 100 percent. i agree because I, I yeah I, I will trip anybody up if they get me to go straight to my feelings it's like who the hell are you get away um but it's just having an awareness around how we all process things differently, I think. For, for me, I'm all about awareness. And once something's in my awareness, then I have a choice and I can do something with it. Well, then you are probably in exalted uh, uh, areas because that's what Freud said. Oh, I hope. <laughs> Freud, the father of psychology, uh, and certainly the father of psychoanalysis, his position was that um, if a person uh, develops awareness, just like you're talking about, uh, that for him was cure. Because from a place of awareness, they then got choices. Well, there you go then. That's what, but seriously, that's, that's my big thing that I talk about all the time with clients. What is that to say? So did Fritz Pearls. So, so did Fritz Pearls, the originated with gestalt psychotherapy which is his major position was awareness and contact yeah and most of his experimental work and gestalt psychotherapy is all about that so you move in exalted company well i have no idea what that means but thank you very much <laughs> <laughs> you know i agree with you awareness is, is is crucial because without awareness often motivation lacks without motivation you know certainly action is in yeah. peace so awareness is really very 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 important and from that choices might happen and action might happen so um many psychotherapies put awareness as top of their bill yeah and i, I think it yeah i just find it really interesting that you, do you know what i mean up until i started my psychotherapy training I was pretty much walking around with blinkers on and not really paying much attention to my response or reaction to 99.9% .9 of things that were going on in my life. Yes, and you may unconsciously or consciously choose not to allow yourself to be aware. Yeah, I think it was probably a conscious thing that I was doing a lot of the time, whereas because, now I've got my blinkers off. Yeah, I was just thinking think of many clients who've come in who aren't aware and then I think of somebody the other day who had a particularly traumatic 
thing happened to them or they were involved in when they were a lot younger. And they'd think often if they did think about it or was aware of it, they stopped themselves thinking about it mm. or being aware of it. So therefore it slipped into a different levels of unconsciousness. But the problem was that that process still drove the organism. Yeah. So to help the person be aware or allow themselves to be aware is one of the prime jobs of a psychotherapist. Yeah. Which is understandable that we would do that, Bob, because it's self-protection and self-preservation if we've been through a trauma. It's yeah. our instinct to not want to think about it or not want to go there. Yeah, ab absolutely. And um, the trauma is put in a compartment. Yeah. So it's got a honeycomb. And you look at honeycombs, you lift it up, you'll see lots of little compartments in the honeycomb. And that's my analogy for trauma. We have the trauma and put into our honeycomb compartment and shut the door. Yeah. And I think a lot of us do that with different things that occur in our life. But yeah. then it does tend to come out at some point <laughs> later on. Yeah, and it certainly leads to a... Um, or may lead to a sense of self which is not particularly healthy in terms of yes. the subject matter we're talking about in terms of self-esteem yeah yeah and you know i know we've discussed it in podcasts in the past those those separate parts of ourselves that need integrating and bringing together to you know to heal really yeah uh integration yeah and I would say integration for me. And uh, we've had a podcast on cure, so it's a really big subject area. But integration for me is the name of the game in therapy. In other words, that people can take back parts they've cut off, defended against, disavowed. Uh, we can take ownership of them again so we can become whole. Yeah. From that place, we can move on. Now, that's a long term process, but that's, I think, the name of the game for a lot of clients I used to work with. Yeah. And again, I know we've spoke about it in the past, but another thing I think is quite important is compassion for ourselves when we're looking at self-esteem and our sense of ourselves as well. I think, you know, with, with trauma, there always comes guilt and shame and all those sorts of things so you know to be compassionate with ourselves that whatever we did in that moment was with the best of intentions we did the best that we could with what we had available at the time especially the last bit there you said of what we had available at the time the resources around us yeah i i, I go for i'm going to pick up on that and say uh, Therapy takes a very much longer, you know, if we can't find compassion for ourselves. And really, I think the hallmark of therapy is when we can start um, facilitating the client to be kind to themselves. Mm. Because without them being kind and friendly to themselves, we the client's got a hard job on his hands because... What, what what happens is they usually have a negative part which is attacking them yeah that part of themselves which can actually stand up to the attacker what happens then the self goes underground and certainly self-esteem goes underground yeah that's a really good way of putting it that yeah and it's true i, I think you know th th that is one of the main things that we we do i i, don't, I was thinking when you were talking then there's there's something about if we show compassion to ourselves it means we can't be compassionate to others it's like we only have one bit of it and we've either got to point it inwards or point it outwards well that's an unhealthy position so that yeah. needs to really work on that yeah um there's a whole therapy movement called compassion focused therapy and i think it's a such a big part of the therapeutic process now the other side of this of course is that therapist needs to be compassionate with themselves yeah if they can't be compassionate with themselves how can they model that down to clients yeah is, is there still something out there with 
the general public or you know just general consensus that you know being compassionate and self-love and all those is selfish yeah you hear that all the time selfish self-indulgent particularly yeah you hear those phrases and a therapist needs to combat that and reframe that whole you know to self-care to be friends with yourself yeah they need they need to reframe those attacking defining um sentence constructions which is usually come from um a negative critical parent somewhere or yeah. something other which they've internalized because it is really important what you said for us to model that but in doing that, you know, showing compassion and self-love to ourselves, we, as therapists, need to prioritise ourselves in the relationship as well. You know, that we're taking care of ourselves, we're not burning out, we're ready, you know, and, and open and willing to see the clients when we're going in there. We're not taking on too many clients, we're aware of our own mental health and all of the above. Yeah, we talked about, I think it was only about, I don't know, five podcasts again, I lose track of this, where we talk about compassion fatigue. Yeah. Exactly what we're talking about here. So, you know, but I will go as far to say that unless we can get to a place where the client can utilise or be in touch with their compassionate self, then, then self-esteem is not likely to grow self-esteem will only grow in the daylight it won't grow in the dark unfriendly places bob you never cease to amaze me in every podcast with your little gems of wisdom that you come up with i need to go back and re-listen to all of them because there's never an episode where you don't blow me away well it's true isn't it it is very true yeah very true yeah, you see, guilt, shame, negativity, they all lie in wait in the dark, unfriendly parts of the soul. Yeah. Until we can get some light on those parts, they will inhabit that dark part of our soul. So we need to use compassion and kindness and love to um get a torch in there so that those parts of ourselves wither away because they are the destroyers of self-esteem yeah but the therapist has to help the client do that yeah and one of the best ways is by modeling compassion so oh. just make them a cup of tea when they come in say hello how have you been Say, what's been happening in your week? Say, oh, I was thinking about you. I'm really curious after what you said last week. Say these sorts of things. That's oh, a really powerful thing, that. Which? To say to a client, I was thinking about you earlier on, or I was thinking about you yeah. last week. That's, that's a, a yeah. definite connection that I've yeah. been picked up on. You know, when a client said, I, I never thought that you would do that outside of the therapy room there's a real connection when that happens yeah yeah i've been thinking about you you're important to me yeah isn't that compassion isn't that love yeah. isn't that curiosity isn't that self-regard yeah and a therapist needs to go out of their way to make those transactions mm. they have to model it downwards now of course we know that clients may actually defend against that because they've never had that in the first place so they may think it's a trick or goodness knows what yeah but the therapist needs to have that intent yes it's the intent which is as important as the action yeah and it's really powerful that bob really powerful mm. i know it is for me i've been on the receiving end of that in therapy and it, it is powerful yeah mm. Mm. the intent is the bit and hopefully we can get the action but you know Unless the therapist can come from that position, how can the client yeah. ever really take it on board? They have to work together. They're on the same journey, not opposed to each other. Yeah. Without that type of 
process. Self-esteem may not thrive. Yeah. That's lovely, Bob. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed this episode. Good, and me, and me. So you so, take care. I will do. Love to you as well. What we're going to do, and love to you, Bob. What The next episode, what we're going to be looking at is working with the perfect client. Oh, my God. The people that set themselves up to fail. The perfect client. Is there such a thing? That's what we're going to be looking at next time, Bob. Is there such a thing as a perfect human? I right, well. Anyway, what a wonderful subject area. Okie dokie. So until the next one, I'll speak to you soon. Yeah, take care. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. You've been listening to The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode.